This is episode 99 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Dr. Vera Tarman has been working in the field of addiction medicine since 1994 and has been the medical director of Renaissance, a treatment center in Toronto since 2006. She is a regular contributor to the call-in TV show Living Clean, Living Well and was co-host on Addictions Unplugged, a community call-in show about addictions. Although she has spoken on various issues in addiction, her special interest is in the area of food addiction. She's the author of Food Junkies, The Truth About Food Addiction, and she will be a featured speaker at the International Conference of Secular AA to be held in Toronto, Ontario from August 24 through August 26. But today, she's my guest. Welcome, Dr. Tarman. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm very well. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Well, it's really nice to have you here. It's been fun this year. I've, uh, you're now the third doctor I've gotten to speak with about addiction medicine, and I still don't quite know if I understand it, but I love speaking with um, people who are in the field of addiction medicine because I feel like I understand it when I'm talking to them. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, um, anyway, why don't we kind of just start a little bit, if you can tell us a little bit about what you do at Renaissance and maybe tell us a bit about Renaissance and what the philosophy is there and the type of um, addictions that you treat and so forth. Well, it's a, it's a Canadian. Canadian Center. I've been working there since 2006. It's a center that uh, has three residences uh, that treats an overall spectrum of uh, drugs and alcohol. It has two, two residences for men and one for women, and I oversee all of them. It's uh, primarily a 12-step focus, and it is um, probably two-thirds Ministry of Health funded, which means that we get everyone from people on the street all the way up to people who have insurance and can um, uh, pay for the service. So it's a really wide spectrum of men and women in all ages. I probably have seen, I probably see on average of a thousand new people a year. So I've seen a lot of people, but you know, it's a, it's a month long program, so I don't see them for very long. And uh, in in my work, uh, which is, I would probably say it's mainly alcohol and cocaine and then opiates sort of in the list of, uh, of prevalence of, of what people seek help for. Then I start to see marijuana a little bit more. And although nobody until the last couple of years has actually come in and asked about uh, food and sugar addiction, I see it all the time. It's just rampant. And it, it's mainly through substitution. You know, the person puts down their alcohol or cocaine and picks up sugar not really thinking that much of it uh, because it's so so ubiquitous you don't even notice but then they talk about it you know months later when they've gained 20 30 40 50 60 pounds and you know back in the old days in um, aa meetings they used to actually encourage the eating of sugar and so forth yes not really wise advice was it yeah no it's even in the literature and you know they did that because it worked and it does work yeah so I, i think that that's still happening but I'm, I mean, one of my overriding goals is that that sort of awareness uh, of uh, the dangers of sugar will be such that people won't make those kinds of suggestions anymore. And that's something I'm learning about, too. Um, I got to speak with a doctor here, Dr. Nicole Labor, who practices addiction medicine in Akron, Ohio. And we were talking about, you know, um, the chemistry of addiction and how it works. And she was basically describing it as a dopamine problem where, mm-hmm. you know, your dopamine levels get so out of whack, so high um, that in the levels that, that were not intended to be and that our brain starts demanding that. And she explained that this can happen through, you know, drugs, alcohol, behaviors, food, anything that drives your dopamine do you see it that way too? And, and if not, can you kind of kind of give me an idea of, of how addiction works and specifically how food and sugar addiction works? Um, yeah, I mean, she's described it very well. People aren't actually saying this on a regular basis, but you could almost see dopamine as a, uh, pardon me, um, addiction as a dopamine impairment syndrome, you know? And if, and if you just look at it from that context, then it's very easy to see how substitution will happen. You know, you can take a drug like alcohol or cocaine, which really ramps up uh, uh, dopamine, and then how easy it is to substitute that 
um, pardon me, substitute that with sugar, which also does the same thing, but on a lower, uh, um, more sub, sub-acute level, but can sort of keep it going. And when we start to understand that, then we understand why it is that people who have been sober for a long time in, in, um, uh, with alcohol uh, end up picking up 20 years later and say, why did I do that? I was going to meetings, I was doing everything I was supposed to do, whatever it is that they were supposed to do to keep their long-term sobriety. But what they probably didn't notice is that, uh, you know, 5, 10, 20 years later, they've realized, oh, my God, I've gained weight. I better stop eating sugar. Uh, they've stopped the thing that has sort of kept the whole addiction wheels going. Uh, they've stopped that. And now their their thirst for alcohol or their other drug comes back because it never really left. It was just um, masked by something else. So the dopamine impairment syndrome or, or um, something like that uh, works really well, uh, y- you know. We have a system of dopamine that is built up. Um, it's, it's part of our brain. It's part of our motivational system. It's the thing that makes uh, you and I want to talk to each other and you know be interested in each other's lives and stories and whatnot. And you know that's a, a sort of normal dopamine response keeps life going, a uh, motivation going. And uh, when we can hijack that with uh, any kind of substance or behavior that will um, take us out of the norm, you know, into what's abnormal or uh, you know what we call euphoria we're overtaxing a system that just can't manage that for very long it tries to deal with it almost immediately by upregulating the receptors basically changing the brain changing the wiring of the brain and when that happens to a degree that um, changes are are when when the changes have, have been under under the onslaught of excessive dopamine for long enough that's, I think, when a person becomes addicted, in other words, behaves in a way that is impairing to their life. And then they can't go back because the receptors never really return back to a normal, robust level like they did before. Hence, you know, once you're a pickle, you're never a cucumber again. You know, you're, once, you're, once you're there, you're not going to be able to go back. Or at least that's the belief in the disease of addiction. Yeah. And I found it interesting, and the reason I'm talking about food addiction so much for those who are listening and, and might not understand is that this is really um, something that you've had personal experience with, and it's something yeah. that, that you're focusing your practice on and um, have done a lot of work with. And yeah. so that's why I thought it would be interesting to, to talk about this. But yeah. my, under- my understanding is once, once, that, once this occurs, once, once that change, that genetic change occurs, it doesn't really matter what drug you're using and right. sugar itself i guess i and i never really realized this but it 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 uses the same um is it neuropathways or whatever as cocaine yeah it's the same neurochemistry it's the dopamine like like it's that whole reward pathway that, that that's where the dopamine goes it's the uh, nucleus accumbens it's part, it's part of what we call euph- euphemistically the limbic system which is the mid uh, part of our brain the motivational, instinctual part of our brain that gets um, kind of uh, hijacked by sugar, and you know, it's it's uh, I, one of the reasons why I get so um, in a state about it is, you know, as we introduce the kind of sugar that we do to our kids, our babies, you know, with with the formula and then the the um, garbage we give kids, we're ramping up that dopamine right from the get go. And, you know, it, it, sugar becomes a gateway for other drugs later, just like other drugs have become a gateway for sugar. It doesn't really matter. So we're creating addicts uh, with our kids, with the foods that we're doing. It's it, it all affecting the same reward pathway. It's just sugar is slower. <laughs> if we could smoke it or inject it, it would be the same. So interesting. You know, when um, I read Tommy Rosen's book, Recovery 2.0, and talked to him on a podcast, and he identified... Um, his consumption of sugar as a kid as what led to his addiction yeah. later yes. on. I found that really interesting. And I totally believe that. Yes, totally believe that. And it's insidious too, because it's, you know, the the way that we live our lives now is so different. I mean, we're, we're people are working more than they ever, ever had to work, you know, and there isn't really time to prepare meals. We're eating a lot of processed foods. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's probably sugar in more stuff than we realize, maybe. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, that, that's the whole definition of processed food. First of all is, you know, we, we've taken, we've extracted from real food, uh, I guess, the, the, the sort of potent ingredients and packaged them into this thing that we call food. 
um, that is very enticing. And already there, it's it's dopamine uh, enhanced. It's basically what it is, dopamine enhanced. Yes, we eat it because it tastes good. It's it's cheap. I mean, you know, the whole reason why processed food was uh, introduced, I guess it was during the wartime, uh, was because if you put a lot of sugar and salt in something, you could um, prolong the shelf life of it, uh, which which it does. And it, I mean, it, it's put everything into the uh, extraordinary realm of experience and with a future. And, and most people don't recognize that because we acclimatize ourselves, just like the alcoholic needs a certain amount just to feel normal. You know, the brain acclimatizes to whatever it's at. And so you need that higher amount. So a person thinks a Mars bar every day or two or three or maybe pop um, is normal and they don't feel necessarily better. They just feel normal because basically they go into withdrawal if they stop. Yeah. Yeah. And what is that withdrawal like? If let's say I wanted to eliminate sugar from my diet, what would I mm. experience? It really depends on the uh, amount of sugar that, that you or a person is, ex- is exposed to. But, you know, this, this, this is one of the things that um, the, the naysayers, the people who say that uh, sugar or food cannot be addictive, is they'll often say, well, there's no withdrawal because there's no seizures, there's no, uh, you know, goosebumps and, and vomiting and, and you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but in fact, they, they're not really asking the right questions or, or asking the people who are really severe, because we don't see those people. Those people are at home, uh, shut-ins. Um, they're not willing to go out anymore. But, you know, if you ask somebody the questions like, uh, you know, do you get a headache? Uh, well, first of all, craving is the big one. Um, you know, anybody, just ask anybody, how would you feel if tonight you're not going to have your favorite whatever it is uh, while you're watching TV? You know, mm-hmm. um, most people have their favorite something and you're not going to get to have that anymore. In fact, you're going to stop eating after six o'clock. You'll be full, but you'll be stopping eating. A lot of people are already uncomfortable. You know, what am I going to do? How am I going to watch my show? How am I going to get to sleep? Uh, and so it's already that, that sort of anticipation of anxiety, which then will lead to potential insomnia, a person will get headaches, um, agitation, real craving, real irritability. And, you know, even uh, ask somebody who's binged uh, the night before, ask them the next day how they feel. Um, uh, short of having a seizure, it's often very much like the alcoholic who feels, you know, very nauseous, like their, their body feels beat up, Um red-eyed, weak, tired, a, a binge, a person who's had a binge will often feel a lot of the same thing, the same kind of shakes, the same kind of diarrhea, the same kind of nauseousness. So there are real side effects, but it depends on, pardon me, uh, withdrawal effects, but it really depends on the extremes. When we talk food addiction, we're talking the extremes. Not everybody in the population is addicted, but they are they are still lured by the addictive nature of food. But it's, it's, it's just like everyone gets drunk if they have a couple of drinks. Not everybody's an alcoholic, <laughs> right? Right, right, um, right. It's the extreme end. That's what we call uh, addiction. And I, I believe that it, you, you put somebody under the exposure of, of uh, a dopamine, uh, uh, in other words, sugar, um, t- long enough, you're going to make anybody an addict, really, yeah. over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, how I, that's how I feel, too. Um, you know, there's this idea that you know, addiction is a disease and that not everybody can get it. But but I think that, you know, if anybody does cocaine enough, they're going to probably become addicted. Or if they yeah. drink enough alcohol long enough, they're going to become addicted. Um, mm-hmm. If you ingest enough sugar long enough, you probably become addicted. Yes. And I guess also, though, there is a genetic component. There is. It, ta- yeah. it does take time for that to kick in, doesn't it? Exactly. It does. And some people get it right away in there. That's the genetic predisposition for sure. Or they, they've been using another substance and didn't realize that they were already creating that um, sort of predisposition. Like, for example, sugar. You know, why is it that some people become more quickly addicts than others? Well, let's look and see what was their sugar intake like before. Like Tommy Rosen probably realized, oh, my God, later, after, after he dealt with his own addiction. That's probably why I got, it hit me harder than my friend. Because look at my food when I was younger. Isn't that interesting? He knew. Yeah. Well, he knew because he's talking to a lot of people and he's getting that exposure. And, you know, thanks to people like you doing these podcasts, more and more people will, you know, make start connecting those dots. Because we don't want to connect those dots in the larger society. If I can just rant for one second. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I work in the medical field, in the addiction field, but I'm exposed 
a lot to uh, other physicians and family docs and um, um, a lot of people uh, who are coming to see me who have issues with obesity, which is, as we know, two-thirds of the population. And in the bariatric community, which is the uh, you know study for uh, obesity or t- treatment of obesity, and in family medicine, the the belief there is how we treat obesity and overweight is you know the calories in calories out model. It's not the addiction model. There's a real resistance to that model. I, I think because they think uh, it's so uh, stigmatic, and you know, why add more shame to an already you know, embarrassing scenario of being overweight and and whatnot. But we don't take this concept of food addiction seriously. Uh, so, you know, bravo for you for bringing this up, because the more we talk about this, the more people are going to go, yeah, this isn't actually stupid. It's not laughable. It's actually, no. yeah. And if people understood the addiction model, I think it would take the shame away because it's a biochemical reaction that we're having. It's, a, it's something that's wrong with our brain, um, which, is, which is an organ. Um, and it makes sense yeah. to me when I think about it. And also, it's like these, you know, these things are like on a spectrum. You know, um, there are people who, um, like, you know, I, I can see where I over, I overdo it. But there are, there, there, you know, I don't think I'm in danger of dying because of the way I eat. But there are uh, people who can't leave their house because they, yeah. because of it. And people Absolutely. who are dying, um, yes, and it's a very, it can be a very, very serious problem. Oh, sure, for sure. I and and you know, I I often uh, think of the example of a patient that I had um, that was a heroin addict and got on methadone and was you know nice and stable and you know left that dangerous life behind and you know did very well and then you know died eight years later of a heart attack and his the the, the buddy that was living with him said, well, you know this this guy went from, you know, he was a jazz player. So, you know, playing jazz at night, you know, the whole part of that heroin drug scene, um, and and basically became a shut-in watching, uh, it wasn't Netflix then, but I don't know what it was, the late night show, eating two tubs of uh, ice cream every night. And what did he die of? He died of a heart attack. So, yeah, and he started to show up less and less to his, you know, his, his music um, because he was embarrassed and felt ashamed about himself. And, yeah. It's a, it's a more, uh, it's not such an obvious, dramatic death, but it is definitely a death. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have been kind of slow in the 12-step community, in my opinion, anyway, and I've been around for a little while, to mm-hmm. taking a more holistic approach to our recovery. Yes. Like, I remember when I started going to meetings, everybody smoked cigarettes, and everybody said, yeah. hey, that's not a big deal. If if you stop drinking, be happy to keep smoking, yeah. you know. And exactly. it's like people are dying from their cigarette smoking. Yes, and, yes. You know, so uh, and like we said, the book Living Sober talks about eating sweets and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And we've just been really slow to say, you know, we need to take an overall look at our at our health and how that <laughs> impacts, you know, our sobriety and our recovery. Yes, that's because right. Because it does it does have a, a big impact. It really does, and and there was a you know a real um, fight with the uh, you know cigarette industry or the tobacco industry to support that message. Of course, they didn't want that to happen, so there was a lot of battle, and and so a lot of clinicians, you know, it, it's all about you don't have to prove that the substance causes problems. You just have to question uh, when when people say that it causes a problem. You just have to question that, and and you know the sugar industry is doing the very same thing. And, and if I want to speak about this, because I can give lots of clinical scenarios, um, people say, show me the research. Well, research costs money. And, and uh, the people who pay for research are the pharmaceutical companies. And in this case, the food industry, they're not going to fund this kind of stuff. Um, so we're kind of, it's a bit of a David and Goliath situation, you know. Um, we, we, the Goliath has the money, and that's the sugar industry, and they, they don't want this message out there. So there's definitely a political underlay uh, underneath this health, just like with the cigarette industry. Well, you know, personally, where, I, where I'm at right now, I, I am trying to pay attention to my health. I'm getting a little bit older, and it's, I'm noticing that, you know, I, I, I'm not moving as quickly as I used to. And yes. so I, I do want to pay attention to this kind of stuff, but also just for my own mental health as well, and um, recognizing how, you know, everything's connected. And um, mm-hmm. I, think, I think doing these podcasts has helped a lot because I've actually talked to people who have taught me these things. So mm. um, I think that 
I don't know, maybe this conversation will be happening more often in the mm-hmm. rooms of 12 step fellowships so that um, people can be more aware of our overall, our yes. overall health. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I think that um, what you, you said before, there's that belief that, you know, let's take care of the addiction that will kill us first. So that would be the alcohol. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, so. So it's, you know, I can say what sugar will kill you, but it'll take 10 years instead of tomorrow. Um, but the other thing is, is it's not just that it'll kill you in 10 years. It's also what's your sobriety like today? Like a lot of people will say, I'm clean and I'm sober, but I'm still unhappy. My mood is still all over the place. They go to a doctor and get prescribed medication for uh, anxiety or depression or bipolar. And that could be because of the food that they're eating, because food will really um, alter mood and, and destabilize mood. People who uh, stop eating sugar will say, I can't believe how steady I feel now compared to before, you know. You can not only get off your diabetic medication, but you may also get off of your antidepressant medication. Like Basically, the quality of your sobriety, I think, improves once you get over a withdrawal piece of sugar, because that takes about two or three weeks. And we probably don't often ask ourselves, like, why am I tired? Is it, you know, it's a lot, yeah. you know, a lot of times we were, pro- maybe I'm just tired because of how I'm e- eating, not necessarily because of anything else. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I mean, you, you mentioned that you're starting, you're getting older and you, you know, you're feeling the fatigue more. Um, I, I know when I lost uh, quite a lot of weight uh, a number of years ago, the thing that struck me the most that I kept saying to myself is, I feel 10 years younger. Um, I, I couldn't go up hills without getting short of breath. I took a cane to sort of be, you know, it's an effective look, so it looks nice, kind of cool. But really, it was to help me sort of pull myself up. I didn't need any of that anymore. I mean, I walk now, I feel much more energy. Like, it really took 10 years off of my life. So the, the quality of sobriety improved. Uh, or, and, and a lot of people don't notice that until they stop. It's like, wow, I didn't know I was living under the, the blanket of this almost oppressive you know, it's like it's like living somewhere where it's there's a heavy blanket of humidity all the time, and then one day it's gone. It's like that. It's like it's something lifts. You know, something I, I found interesting too, as I was reading through your website, is that um, you you were talking about um, treating food addiction through the abstinence model and focusing yeah. on the food that triggers the addiction. Absolutely. And I think that was the first time I've ever read that. Um, I rem- I've, I had a friend that was in OA for ma- many, many years, had a really bad yeah. um, overeating problem. And he would always tell me, he said, John, you know, the, the toughest thing about being an overeater is that, you know, I have to eat to survive. And, you know, so in other words, he was saying it's not like in, with drink with drugs and alcohol where you have total abstinence. But I found it interesting that that you were writing about this whole idea of, yes, identify whatever that trigger food is and maintain abstinence. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, remember I was talking a little earlier about the, um, you know, if a person goes to get help for their overweightness or their obesity or their diet because they've got diabetes and they go to their dietitian to talk about what should I eat now, uh, they will always get um, what we call a moderation eating plan. Um uh, and that is, and, and, and they get, and people get very adamant about it. They say, um, you, you can have a little bit of chocolate. You can have a little bit of your favorite, uh, you know, cookie that your mom made you or whatever, or, you know, your own baking, uh, just don't have that much of it. Um, and if you say, if a person says, I have a really hard time with that, it's actually just easier if I don't have it. There's a real, um, it, it's not just that people don't get it. It's like, almost like they don't. There's a real discouragement about that, probably because there's a whole history of uh, eating disorder um, paradigm where when people would binge or, or um, you know, bulimia binge and purge, they would often, in order to get out of that, restrict their food and then become extremely restrictive. So, you know, these foods are bad and I'm not going to have this much and, and actually just uh, make the whole condition worse. So... Generally, clinicians fear that if I say you can't have something, in other words, you have to be abstinent from something, it, it, it's almost like harking back or bringing back that, that sort of potential dynamic of the binge purge cycle. So they, they don't want that. So it, it, it's considered that the best thing to do is just learn how to moderate. But really, you and I know that, that I don't know what your substance of choice is, but 
I can't tell you to just have a, you know, crack on the weekends. It right. just doesn't work. <laughs> no. and, and it doesn't work for me to have, uh, you know, a little bit of alcohol or a little bit of sugar because the moment I have it, we know it. It sets up the phenomena of craving. It, it, it sets up the desire of, oh, that was really nice. I forgot how nice that was. And then it just sits there like an earworm that grows and grows. And if you don't pick up later that day, you will sometime in the next whatever, six months or two months or next week. Um, and and uh, that's then considered, uh, you know, poor willpower in the other model. And, and um, I see people who go and do that moderate model and fall off. You know, that's why so many people keep, you know, they lose the weight and then they gain it back. So the, the abstinent model, which is so obvious to you and I, because we're coming from an addiction framework, is um, not that obvious and, in fact, is feared, uh, uh, you know, because of the eating disorder model that has preceded it. Uh, so people don't want to do it. And, and we're talking about established, uh, well-known bariatric clinicians say, no, uh, you just got to learn how to moderate. And I would just like to say, look, that might work for, you know, how many hmm. food addicts are there in the population? Probably 30 to 40 percent at max. So that advice might work for 60 percent of the population, the moderate one, just like there are some people who can do a controlled drinking program. You know, like we have those programs, right? Sure. They, they must work for somebody. They don't work for us, but they work for somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, these moderate programs will work for somebody. But if anybody is listening to this who says, well, I tried that and it's not working, it's because you don't belong there. You belong here, which is an abstinence program. And the abstinence is um, almost invariably universally sugar. Um, uh, and uh, then it depends on the extreme of the addiction because, you know, just like any addiction, there's a chronic progressive nature. Um, so we talk about food addiction as being, you know, mild, moderate, or extreme. There's different phases. And stopping sugar might be enough. But for some people, like myself and, and others who have, you know, really gone, you know, to town with, with um, uh, we can't even eat flour. Uh, because flour, you know, according to the glycemic index, which is how quickly food breaks down into sugar, carbs break down into sugar, um, uh, that's too much, that's already too much of a hit of sugar. So eating a bagel is, you know, a bagel is basically sugar in five minutes. That's wow. too close. That's too close. I can't eat a bagel. I can eat Brussels sprouts because that takes about two hours before it becomes sugar. Brain doesn't care for something. It, it, it likes fast, you know, the fast immediate hit. A Brussels sprout does not give you a fast immediate hit, but a bagel will, as will pizza, as will pop, uh, popcorn even. Believe it or not, even popcorn. Um, so for some people, an abstinent plan will be sugar and flour. And then even if you really extreme, some people, especially in my experiences, um, when people hit menopause or in their 50s, metabolism slows down, even grains. So even like the healthy quinoa and the healthy rice and the healthy oat, you know, even that, they have to stop. And, Interesting. You know, yeah, and you might think, wow, that, what, what can you eat? Well, there's a lot you can eat, but you can't eat sugar flour grains. I guess also the sugar that is in a lot of our foods and so forth, like, like we were talking about earlier, this, this isn't really natural like what you get from fruits and vegetables. This, exactly. this is like in really highly concentrated levels. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so people often say, well, you know, there's sugar in fruit. Yes, there is, but there's also fiber and there's also all sorts of things that make that, that piece of fruit um, not an immediate hit, like uh, just, you know, apple juice or apple cider or apple drink, you know. Another little thing, I think I read it from a little bit of your book, I started reading your book, and it was like um, the people in South America who are chewing the cocoa leaves, you know, Yes. Um, that's not, you know, they can do that and it's not a big deal. But if you were to refine that into, yes. you know, powder, it's a different deal. Exactly, exactly. Or, you know, if you take a rotting grape that's fermenting, uh, yeah, you'll get a little bit of a buzz, but you you got to do a lot and you'll get sick far sooner, like, you know, rotting grapes, fermenting grapes, you're going to get sick to the point where you would be sick uh, uh, too soon for you to get drunk, you know, because you, you're going to get sick and you won't be able to take enough. And, and similarly with food, like there's only so much fruit you can eat um, before you get stuffed and full. So, so there's sort of natural checks and balances that nature puts in so that we don't reach those peaks that, that overwhelm us. But we, we just blow, blow those peaks, uh, or pardon me, those natural uh, checks and balances out of the water with the way that we, uh, with the food industry. 
So what's treatment like um, for somebody who's dealing with a food addiction? Um, is it similar to any other drug addiction? Is it yeah. maybe some yeah. inpatient followed up by some peer support or something? Well, yeah. So so um, because food addiction is officially not yet a diagnosis, it's not even in, in the DSM-5, which is you know the bane to all of our existence, because if it were, it, it would be covered by insurance. Uh, it, the main place where people have sought treatment has been in the community, uh, and that's been through, you know, the pr- individuals who set up their own sort of private thing, like a private food coach or whatever. And not many of those folks do the uh, uh, abstinence model. They may say that they do food addiction, but anybody who's listening here, please ask the question of uh, not just the diagnosis, yeah, I'm a food addict, but what's the treatment? Is it food addiction, true treatment, which is this abstinence? Identifying your drug, which is sugar, maybe flour, maybe grains, and then being abstinent. Um, and there are a few places in the States that, that do that model, um, but you have to hunt. Uh, you know, it's, it's a small community of us clinicians, and we know each other pretty well. Then there's, of course, the 12-step programs, and um, OA uh, is sort of the mother of the food programs, but it, um, OA uh, has a, a, um, a philosophy that's called a dignity of choice for food, and so some people will follow a very abstinent program, but you might be sitting next to somebody where their abstinence is just, um, I only eat uh, sugar on Saturdays, but I still get to eat it sometime. So so there isn't sort of a defined one uh, program or uh, of eating in OA, but it is a place that people go. There's a couple of other uh, um, 12-step programs that are quite defined, like Food Addicts Anonymous and Food Addicts in Recovery Anonymous. They have their own plan smaller group and then another group called gray sheet anonymous and they too have their own plan so a person will have to hunt around for these 12 steps and then really ask those questions now in terms of inpatient treatment because it's not covered by insurance it, it, it there's a few people uh, pardon me uh, centers that offer services but uh, it's costly because you have to pay out of pocket in, in canada um we have a, a food addiction program now that's sort of in year one it was year one it was last year it was a pilot project uh, very successful uh, and now we're um, uh, sort of we, we've launched it out as a uh, program that the uh, treatment center will follow uh, and uh, that's we're in our first year of that and what we're doing there is putting people who are identified as food addicts not necessarily any other di- addiction other than food and bringing them in the same classroom as uh, or lecture room as uh, people with uh, cocaine and alcohol addiction they go to the same meetings uh, basically the same stuff, um, although there is, um, you know, there are um, particular uh, counseling and um, things that are specific to food. But the idea is we're treating everything as addiction. And, I mean, I, it, it's, it's working very well. It's I'm just unfortunate that it's not covered uh, by uh, an insurance plan or by the government. Yeah. It makes sense to me. The more I, the more I learn about how addiction works, too, the more, the more sense it, it does make to me. So what do you think it is about the 12 steps um, or these 12-step fellowships that are so effective? Well, you know, the 12-step program is, it, it's, you know, step one is identifying that you're powerless. So uh, if you truly, truly, truly identify that you're powerless, uh, like I mean, people always say, if you relapse, you're back to step one because you still don't somewhere in there believe that you're powerless. So if you really get that you're powerless, then abstinence is step one. But then you've got 11 other steps because you have to live now in your abstinence in a way that is happy or, I guess, happy, joyous, and free. And, and uh, it's going to take the rest of those steps to live that way. Um, you know, I work in the addiction field, which is not just the 12-step field. I have the luxury of working at uh, Renaissance, which is 12-step, so I can speak that language. And I, I really love working there because we have this focus on a lifestyle of sobriety. Out there in the world, uh, outside of that, it's really just step one. Let's get the person clean, maybe through methadone or, or, or some kind of drug, anti-craving drug, and then you throw them out to deal with their life on their own, maybe with meds and their psychiatrist. But, you know, how well does that work? Um, I, I, I really think that we need something, if, it, if nothing else, the community of support uh, to stay sober and to want to stay sober, you know, and that's what 12-step does. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it's so hooked to, you know, the 1940s uh, language and, and uh, you know, its history. It's unfortunate. We're working on changing that, I think, a little bit. Yeah. You know, what's, what's interesting, um, there have been quite a few people that have contacted our podcast that are from Overeaters Anonymous. In fact, we did a uh-huh. podcast with a 
woman from uh, OA in London. And they, she says that, um, and others that I've talked to said that there's a, there aren't any secular alternatives in OA, which is no, kind of frustrating wow. for them. Like we have an AA, we have quite a few now secular AA meetings now. In fact, you're going to be speaking at our yeah. international convention here pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts about that anyway? Um, well, it's it's uh, it's interesting because I've never thought about speaking in that context. I'm usually thinking about the context of uh, food and alcohol. Um, I think I think it's great. I mean. I always, when I, because, you know, I'm talking to people um, in the public who are coming, you know, because I'm a doctor for addictions, and the major uh, complaint, because I think AA is, is so helpful, uh, the major complaint that people have is, I don't like the God thing, or I'm afraid it's a cult. And uh, <laughs> I always say, look, there is an, agno- there is an agnostic um, uh, contingent, uh, and it's getting stronger. And, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, when you talk about, use the word higher power, it is there is an an agnostic thread throughout it. You just have to learn how to just ignore some of the other stuff, which is fine to do. So I feel like I'm quite equipped to speak, but I just never have in the past. It's, it's actually quite interesting to do so. Oh yeah, I think you're going to really enjoy it. And yeah, something that I find really interesting about the community of atheists, agnostics, freethinkers, however you want to define us in AA, is the tremendous diversity amongst us. Um, in our experience, um, I don't know what we have in common all when you get down to it, except for maybe our addictions, but we have, and you'll find this. Um, I think the majority of us are, um, the majority of us probably, um, have adapted the, the 12 steps in some way in our recovery. Yeah. And the fellowship is important to us. Community is important to us. Supporting each other, that kind of thing is probably how the majority of us feel. But then there's another part of our community that says, I have nothing to do with those 12 steps. I don't even want to interpret them in a different way. you know. <laughs> and, um, oh gosh, we're just all over the map. But that's just the way that AA is in general anyway, because, you know, every yeah. group is, is, does its own thing. And we're all from different parts of the world and we all gather together in one place every couple of years. And, um, that's where we get to see, oh, wow, you guys do things different in New York than we do in Kansas City. And, yeah, so I think that that what is what I find so interesting is is that that diversity. Um but it's also a lot of fun. I think that you'll I think you'll really enjoy it and and seeing um all these meeting all these people from around the world. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward to it. I especially because I'm so used to um you know, the AA does have a very Christian background and I'm so used to that expectation and uh I just want to box people's ears when they when they uh, say, you know, how are we going to close the meeting? And the guy starts with the Lord's Prayer. It's like, oh, my God, why are we still doing that? Um, you know, so it will be nice to be in an environment where, um, you know, that when, at least we're at least we'd move beyond that. Because, you know, even even if you are religious, you may not be a Christian, for God's sake, you know. One thing that I, I noticed about the these conventions that I hope that we'll we'll see here, too is there's a certain amount of excitement because it's like everything is new again. So people are talking about, oh, yeah, I'm going to go home. I'm going to start a meeting. You know, I'm going to, uh, you know, I want to learn how to do this and that. And yeah, that, that's like different a, from what. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like like an agnostic OA meeting. Yeah. I never thought about that until you mentioned it. Yeah. And an agnostic, we need those. And we also need agnostic um, Al-Anon meetings, too. That's another um, email we get every once in a while. For sure. But yeah, so I hope I hope that you do enjoy that that aspect. It'll be quite an experience to say the least. But I'm really looking forward to your talk, and I also look forward to reading your book as well, uh, "Food Junkies: The Truth About Food Addiction." I just started it today. I wish I would have had a chance to read it before I spoke with you, but um, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to write about it because uh, I think Good. it's a really interesting topic, and I know for sure there's a lot of people that visit our site that are interested in this as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking me. I really, I really appreciate that. Well, I look forward to meeting you. Uh, my wife and I will be driving up from Kansas City, and we're oh. going to spend a couple days before the conference, a couple days after the conference. Uh, neither of us have been to Toronto before. Both excited about seeing the city.
And thank you for listening. We'll be back again real soon.